Uh-oh, we got a point here. Double point. They're in there. This week on we Kentucky man, Field, we've got the dogs on point, and we're busting quail. There they go. Hunting some prime habitat down in Logan County. I bet that, now yes. that's what we're talking about right there, Mike. <laughs> Then we sit down with a fishing legend. I put him in the cooler. He was too big for the cooler. And hear the story of the world record smallmouth bass straight from the mouth of the man who caught Shook it. Shook his head, he threw that out and loosened the bathroom up. It's all next on Kentucky Field. Such a pretty fish. Beautiful. This pond is plum floated with frogs. They're everywhere in here. <laughs> Yeah, this is a good fish right here. Really good fish. Come here, girl. Hey, boy. That's a big rabbit. Nice job. Yes! Yes! <laughs> My first musket. Mercy <laughs> <laughs> Leo! Yeah, we're here to get the Here it goes! Boom! Oh, oh. Yes. Oh. Wow, that happened. Hello and welcome to Kentucky Field. I'm your host, Chad Miles. Join us as we journey the Commonwealth in search of outdoor adventure. Do you want more wildlife and maybe even quail on your property? Let's go hunting with small game biologists and find out exactly how you can make that happen. So we're in Logan County here today doing a little small game hunting and I'm with the right crew for that, right? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what we're here for, for sure. <laughs> small game program coordinator here. And uh, John, everybody's farm looks just like this, doesn't it? Oh, right. Everybody yeah, when you drive across farm, the state, they look just like this, don't they? That's right. No, really, this is perfect for a small game, Absolutely. isn't it? Absolutely. This is a primo farm and we've been working with Mike for a couple of years. And it's very rare that a landowner actually listens to some of the things we mentioned, <laughs> and you're going to see a lot of great habitat today thanks to the work of Mike and his family and friends that come out here and work with him to, to make it look like this. So Mike, tell me a little bit about your piece of property you got here. Obviously it looks like it was built for small game, but you told me you're mainly a deer and turkey guy. I am. Uh, I do enjoy seeing the quail, seeing the small game, but uh, when we started out with it, it was mostly deer and turkeys, but uh, found out that what you do bleeds over into the small game too. Hopefully it seems to be working, we'll see. We also have Zach Danks, and Zach, you're the turkey program coordinator as well as grouse. When you put out plots like this and you let the CRP grow up for small game, what's your turkey population gonna be like as well? You'd be doing the best you could do to help that local population and anything you could do. Quail management is, is turkey brood management, and if you want more turkeys, you gotta have more baby turkeys, and this cover for nesting and brood rearing is it's vital. Let's go meet dogs and load up, what do you think? Let's do, do it. it. Right. Let's do it. Let's go. Are you running beepers on these dogs if they go on point? Not beepers. So I've got a, like a GPS unit. It tells me when they stop, when they go on point. So there'll be times when they stop that I can't tell if they're stopped to use a bathroom or if they're actually pointing. I got you. But I'll have to be watching it and, and tell you. It's so thick, I was wondering to see how you knew when one was on point. Yep. So I didn't realize you had GPS on them. I run bells usually, but I've only got one bell now. So between the bells and the GPS, the beeper is handy. I have one on her, so we can use it if we need to. Okay. Oh, look at this nice ragweed strip. This is your food source mixed in with the cover. Hey, John, look for May up there. 52 yards from me. It's just saying she stopped right to your left. What you got, May? What you got, girl? What you got? Raina, too. Uh -oh. One of them, May broke, it looks like. 33 to blue. He broke. This is wild bird hunting here. They'll run on the ground and take off on you some. This is really, really, really thick, but you can see that there is an area in the bottom where you can tell that the very bottom undergrowth is kind of missing. And this is perfect habitat for quail. They can get in here, areas to feed, but yet there's a cover, a canopy that keeps aerial predators from coming down and picking them all off. Everything wants to eat a quail. They're birdie right here. Looks like it. At 41 yards, right up in the sumac. Oh, she's on dead point. Over there, Mike. Did you break? 
she broke. Man, this is pretty prime right through here. Yeah, it looks perfect. Got a point? Yep. Where are they at? They're in here. Nothing? You think these birds flew? Maybe we didn't see them or hear them, but might have been where they were. Who knows? So far, we're 0 for 3 on covey encounters. The law of averages would you eventually get one to fly. Well, you would think. Habitat's ever-changing. A lot of people just don't recognize how nature's constantly evolving and changing, and we're constantly trying to maintain cover. So tell me a little bit about what you need for good quail habitat. When we talk about Bob White, we always talk about the bees, bunch grasses. We've got a bunch of bunch grasses behind mm -hmm. us, those native warm season grasses. Bare ground, that's what Mike's making when he's burning. And part of what that burning does is diversify the plant community in different stages of plants. So he's resetting the plant community when he burns a patch, and that creates that opportunity to get that bug community in place. So if you get all those bees right, we'll have birds, and that's what we hope we find today. Oh, this looks good. Oh, they're in here. Zach and I will go on the upper side. You guys stay down over here. Let's make a miracle happen. There you go. How about that, Now guys? that's what we're talking about right there, Mike. <laughs> Hey, mate. See it? This bird here. is a juvenile. You see those white tip feathers here? These are the secondary coverts. And when they're white tipped, that's a juvenile. When they're really, they're fuller and completely gray when it's an adult. So it means it was hatched this summer. We had two or three times when we thought we had birds. That last one held really tight. It was right in the corner. So as we make our way down here to this corner or that corner, I feel very comfortable that we're going to flush another covey of quail here. The dogs are working good. Oop, deer, look at all of them. Tails going everywhere. That's the thing about this cover is the deer are secure here, 365. You know, I mean, they just come out to eat a little bit, come back bed in this, go in the woods. Dog still on point? Yep. She's 49 yards up ahead there. Oh, did you get one down? Yeah. Nice. All right. It's a little late getting up here on that. We had all three dogs on point, and as we come over the ridge here, the covey flushed. I think we got one down. Let's go see. Dead. Dead. Got it? Good girl. Well, that is a beautiful bird. I tell you what, you never get sick of seeing those dogs on point walk over and hear that flush. Yeah, it's a special right. moment in the hunting world. It really, really, truly is. Turkey, turkey, turkeys. Oh, if it was fall turkey season, Mike, we might have switched gears. Yeah. <laughs> uh oh, we got a point here. Double point, they're in there. There they go! I will never do that again. Mike, I couldn't even pick my bird. Everyone I picked I, was going down. I killed three. You, you got killed three? three. <laughs> I did. I knocked down three birds. I'll never do it in my life again. Mike. All right, Raina. Right here, Raina. There's one. There you go. Right dead there. Birds, She's got birds. one right here. Yeah, that, that one got hit awesome. really hard. Dead blue, dead. Here's one right here. Man. Way to awesome. go, dude. Holy oh. cow. Well, I'll tell you what. I think that was a pretty good day. It's been a long time since I flushed cubbies of quail. And your all's dogs did great. Mike, it's obvious that all your habitat work is paying off. Well, I hope so. It makes me feel pretty good to have a day like this. It's been over 63 years since David Hayes caught the world record smallmouth bass at Del Hollow Lake, a record that some say will never be broken. Hello, I'm Leonard Melton from Nashville, Tennessee, and I'd like you to meet Mr. D.L. Hayes, who has just caught the world's record smallmouth, 11 pounds, 15 ounces. Mr. Hayes, how did you catch this fish? Uh, I caught him, caught him trolling from an uh, outboard cruiser. Today I'm here with an old friend, D.L. Hayes. How are you doing today? Okay. So you caught the world record smallmouth bass and most people who fish, they think, man, if I could ever catch a world record, then that would be the epitome of your fishing career. But for you, it's been an interesting journey, hasn't it? Yes. 
you caught hundreds and hundreds of fish on Dale Hollow, obviously. You fished it for years and years, and you used some very unique techniques. You know, Dale Hollow, if you've ever fished Dale Hollow Lake, Dale Hollow's got grass mats, and then it's got edges where it just falls off into real deep water. And you would locate those areas that you wanted to fish right on those edges. And how'd you do that? Well, we had a early uh, depth finder. It was a pretty good one. One of the interesting stories about the day I caught the record, mm -hmm. it was a cove we had to swing in to get the plug where we wanted it on the shale bank. Mm -hmm. And um, Mr. Willis and I went down there looking to catch us big fish, mm -hmm. we nicknamed him Old Joe. Okay. And every time we went, the year I caught it, there was this couple was sitting on the bank in chairs, and they took their bait out in the middle of the cove and left it and went back and sat in the chairs. And we couldn't troll where we wanted to. Okay. And uh, they'd been there every weekend for three or four weeks. So I decided I'm going down there on Monday. And I, my son and wife, I told them, get ready. We're going to leave early and drive down to Dale Hollow. So my boat was already down Cedar Hill. And uh, they were with me when I caught the fish. Oh, wow. They were asleep in the boat. I had a Lone Star 21-foot aluminum had place to sleep, and I had to have somebody to help me land that fish. And I kicked the door, woke her up. She came out about half asleep. And I told her what she had to do. The fish, I knew he was going to be wore out trolling, and uh, he'd be floating on top of the water and I dare not touch him. Mm. So I figured a plan before I got him to the boat and I'll turn the wheel real quick and let him float behind the boat and outrigger where the motor was sitting on. And I wet my net, put one foot out on that outrigger and put the net down deep in the water where he float over top of it when the boat was turning and I scooped him up. Wife said, I thought he was dead at floating. I said, you found out what was smallmouth possum on you. Yeah, oh yeah. But when I set that net down on the floor of the boat, he came alive and he flopped all over the floor. <laughs> I put him in the cooler and he was too big for the cooler. When I got to the dock with him, he had the bands. Oh, yeah. So you, you talk about getting to the dock. So you were trolling. You were trolling a bomber-style crankbait. Actually, we've got that exact same bait right here. You were trolling this this, this exact bomber bait. That's and it's a bait. Interesting is when I look at it, it, it you know, normally these have treble hooks here and treble hooks when here. When he came up, shook his head, he threw that out and loosened the bat going up. Yeah, it is. It's, it's a little bit loose right there. And you told me this bait was fairly new when you started fishing, you know, that weekend, and it's all scratched that up. Was, so. That was the first fish I caught on that plug. Wow. You, interestingly enough, you caught this fish trolling, and back then you used to troll with a with a metal style rod, and you know, these old pin reels. And what pound test with line were you throwing? A 20 pound. 20 pound, and you would troll this lure, this this plug, how far behind the boat? Oh, anywhere from 250, 300 feet. Okay, so it was back there a long way. So you're talking about wearing the fish out. It wasn't like you hooked it and immediately netted it. It had all kinds of time to play itself out yeah. to, uh, to get it to the boat. He came up one time, and then he went down deep, and he didn't come back on top of the water till he got tired. Oh, yeah. When he got tired, I floated around on top of the water. 
So you, you had the fish weighed and you knew it was 11 pounds, 15 ounces, but the scales weren't certified. So then you took the fish back down to Cedar Hill, which is a pretty long way, isn't it? <laughs> 17 miles. 17 miles. So you and your wife drove down there. Now you knew if the if the number on the certified scale held up, did you know then it was gonna be a world record? No. You still didn't know? No. No, so you just knew it was a really, really big fish and you'd been chasing that I fish. I just knew it was a big fish. Yeah. So once you got down to Cedar Hill, they then weigh the fish again and it comes up that it weighed the same as you'd already had it weighed. I right? was I was straightening the boat up and one thing or another, putting the curtains on it. And the guy worked the dock. Said you got did you catch any fish? I said yeah, I got one. So I opened the cooler up. He says, my God, let me have that fish. <laughs> he took off, took it inside. When I came in. Mr. Roberts said, you know, you got a world record fish. I said, oh, quit pull, pulling my leg. Yeah. I said, I know it's a big fish. You weren't out there targeting world records. You were just out looking for fish. And you knew there was a big fish there because you and your fishing partner, you think, had hooked the fish. So I'm guessing every fishing trip after you'd hooked a really big fish there, you'd always, at some point in the day, troll through that spot, right? Yeah. We knew where he lived. Yeah. We had him on three times. The third time I caught him. Yeah. Once you took it back down there and you handed them the fish and they, they went in and they came out and said, you've got a, it's a world record. I'm guessing at that point in time, it was a certified scale and they probably called the Fish and Wildlife Agency at that point in time. Yeah. So the fish is then, is sent off and it goes up and it gets mounted up near Chicago. And then you get the fish back it goes on your shelf. You have a record saying, congratulations, you got the world record. And then lo and behold, 40 years later, you get a phone call saying, it's no longer the world record. And you, you gotta be thinking, what is going on? Well, Film Stream called me on the telephone. They wanted to write a story mm -hmm. about the fish. And uh, he asked me a lot of questions. So they printed a story because they didn't do that to start with mm -hmm. when they were keeping the record. Mm -hmm. uh, they put it in the magazine, but they didn't put any story with it. So it came out in the magazine. After they found out that they took the record off, he called me. He said, we just published a story not too long ago and we're embarrassed. I said, you're embarrassed? How do you think I feel? Yeah. I said, this is all sudden to me. Mm -hmm. and, and that's all he said much. He didn't discuss it. That was the end of it. And this whole, in, this whole embarrassing episode of this all started from an individual who had written an affidavit saying that he had handled the fish. Not, not you, that he had handled the fish. I don't know what brought it all on. Yeah. Actually, uh, there are a lot of stories told. Some of them probably true, some of them wasn't. Mm -hmm. I'm glad it's all over. Yeah. Still the record. Uh, still the record, rightfully so the record, because you had all the dimensions of the fish and the weight of the fish in two different er two different areas and the dimensions of the fish. And every time anyone has ever tried to do any modeling of all the dimensions that we have of the fish, it comes up that the fish should probably weigh more than 11 pounds, 15 ounces, not less. The fish was in the, you caught it in July. So if you take all the dimensions of the fish and let's say that it's not super, super big and fat, it still should have weighed close to 12 pounds, and that's that's what the numbers show. So a lot of times goes by, and obviously you'd been through this heartache with this, with people trying to tell you they had manipulated your fish, and finally it all gets put to bed, and the IGFA reissues your world record. People would think, wow, I bet you got tons of money for that, and I bet you got really wealthy off catching the world record. That's not the case, is it? 
<laughs> no. no. Tell I, me. All I got out of it was trouble. <laughs> what did you actually get for catching that world record fish? Got a few bombers. Mm-hmm. Somebody sent me a cooler. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I got some uh, fishing line, Montefeldman. In about 2010 is when you and I met. And I wanted to do something to commemorate your catch. And we had a painting made that has all the dimensions of the fish by artist Rick Hill. Rick did a great job on that painting, didn't he? And he the, did a wonderful job. And we have, you actually have one hanging right back here yeah. behind me, yeah. So we, we did that and actually it turned into, a, uh, turned into a whole lot of stuff because we made this painting. One, I wanted a way to commemorate this in a positive way for you. And we also ended up selling a bunch of these prints of this fish and generating some money for youth conservation camps. And you agreed to, to do that with us and we sold them really fast. <laughs> but then after that, we ended up taking that exact same painting and making a license plate which you have some of those as well. And we also ended up taking the painting in the exact dimension and dedicating a boat ramp in your honor. Yeah. And that boat ramp, I still use it all the time when I go down there. Mr. Hayes, you were obviously way ahead of your time, the way you were going down there and, and, and targeting these fish. I always say that fishing is 90% luck and 10% know how. Yeah, yeah. And that's it. Yeah. I'd like to know how many times your story has been told between two fishermen down there on the boat sitting there trying to, trying to catch a big fish. I would say some of your stories that people didn't get firsthand. They may have gotten it through reading. People have fished a million spots down there saying, I'm fishing the spot where the world record was caught or we're going to do the same thing that Mr. Hayes did to catch the fish. But like you said, a lot of it just turns out to be luck. But I think your record, I do think it's pretty safe and I can't think of a better person to hold the world record and I hope you keep it forever. I just hope I catch one close, but not as big. <laughs> well, Mr. Hayes, thank you so much for your story today and it's been a pleasure. Glad, glad you stopped by. I, I enjoy talking to you every time. You were revolutionary when it comes to catching fish and you got a world record to, to show for it. Now let's check in and see who else has been out having fun in this week's Ones That Didn't Get Away. Michael Woosley knows how to start off hunting. It's squirrel hunting. He got this nice squirrel in Beech Grove, Kentucky on the opening day of the season. Congratulations. Aiden Jackson has already moved on to fly fishing. This is his first fish ever with a fly rod caught in Owen County while fishing with his pawpaw. Nice job. Here's a really cool fish, a 14 pound flathead catfish caught by Amber Stamper while fishing with her dad. Nice job. Check out this smile on James Dobie. He's three years old and caught this fish, his first fish ever at Salado. Nice job. Johnny Martin did a little predator hunting while on a deer hunt at Green River WMA. Nice job. Here we have Linnell Jackson with the biggest sunfish she's ever caught. Nice job. Here we have Kennedy Crouch who's six years old. She's showing us her very first deer ever, a nice four point buck taken in Bath County. Congratulations. Here we have a nice flathead catfish caught by a briar vendor who's eight years old from Ohio County. She caught this fish in her Papa David's pond. Check out this crew. We have Jim Bowie, Scott Wilson, and Eric Reed who are at Lake Harrington fishing for hybrid striped bass. Said they all got their limit this day. Nice job. Here we have all the Fletcher boys who have been out doing some bass fishing. From left to right, we got Jager, Jackson, and Gunner. They're all big fans of Kentucky Field, and they're great fishermen as well. Congratulations. Here we have 10-year-old Tyler Gabbard with a nice largemouth bass caught at a farm pond in Grayson County. Just a reminder, your hunting and fishing license expire at the end of this month, and it's gonna quit raining soon, and you're gonna to wanna to go fishing. Pick up your license at fw.ky.gov or anywhere licenses are sold. And remember, hunting and fishing on private property is a privilege. Always ask permission and thank the landowner. Until next week, I'm your host, Chad Miles, and I hope to see you in the woods or on the water. 
soon you'll use this to swat flies, swat skeeters, or maybe some old dog. Meanwhile, it looks good just waiting. See all the Kentucky Afield stuff at the Kentucky Afield store. Dear Mom, I know a secret. You're a kid, too. Salado is open and open for fun. <laughs> we can go see deer, wink at wildcats, and giggle at that big black bear. You know he's your favorite. There's enormous elk, awesome aquariums, and we can even take a picnic lunch. And if you're really good, I'll let you take me back again. The Salado Wildlife Education Center in Frankfurt. Come prowl a while.